Welcome to the second Sunday after Epiphany worship service of Myersville Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, both in Long Hill Township, New Jersey, for January 15th. Our in-person services are for the month of January at First Presbyterian on Central Avenue in Sterling. That's at 10 a.m. and all are most welcome to join us. Both churches have selected for their January special missions, food ministries. First Presbyterians is the Super Bowl of Caring, a collection begun in relation to the Super Bowl in February. Through this collection, the church gives financial support to local food ministries. Myersville's special mission is Bridges Outreach, which helps homeless folks find food and shelter and other services in Newark, in New York, in Irvington, and Summit by building relationships with these folks so that they are willing and trusting enough to receive the help being offered. You can help with these ministries by sending your check to the respective church. And now, let us worship God. I invite you to join me in our responsive call to worship. This comes from Psalm 40. Our Lord puts a new song in our mouths, songs of praises to our God. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord our God, your wondrous deeds, and your thoughts towards us, none can compare with you. Were we to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are beyond the grasp of our highest thought, but within the reach of our frailest trust. Come in the beauty of this day, and reveal yourself to us. Enrich us out of the heritage of seers and scholars and saints into whose faith and labors we have entered. And quicken us to new insights of our time that we may be possessors of the truth of many yesterdays, that we may be partakers of your thoughts for today and creators with you of a better tomorrow. We pray in Jesus' name the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our first scripture reading comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples, from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant and to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, starting with verse 29. The next day of John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is, this is of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water of this reason, that he might reveal to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a bath, and remain from on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descended and remain in one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself seem to have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. As he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, there's the Lamb of the God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, The rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of them who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which translated Peter. From Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, so if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Or from the book of Revelation, see, I am making all things new. Or from second Peter, we wait for new heavens and a new earth. Or from Colossians, 
being clothed in a new self. The New Testament is, is all about becoming new, about new beginnings. And these passages could be joined by lots more telling us that we are new in Christ, calling us to new lives as Christian disciples. Now, new lives often bring us new names. When our country holds elections every four years, the leadership of our country usually changes names. The president is different. The political party in charge is often different. We had the Roosevelt years, the Kennedy era, the Reagan years, all of them different. The different names calling to our minds changes in mood, in culture, in trends. Our national identity and national purpose shifts a bit as the presidencies change. Taking a new name has always been an important way of revealing new information about a person's role or identity. People change their names for all kinds of reasons. When they get married, join a religious order, when they're adopted, do a gender transition. We also demonstrate changes in our lives when we add letters to the back of our names, MD, PhD, Rev, RN. Earning those letters means taking on the identities of doctor, professor, pastor, nurse. This is in addition to whatever other titles might already define who we are. Mother, father, daughter, brother. The letters, the rules we take on, the roles we take on or are given because of our birth may or may not have that much to do with who we really are. Take the wily name changer of the Old Testament, Jacob, for example. He was famous or maybe infamous for his ability to take on new identities. He was the almost firstborn born grabbing the heel of his twin, Esau. Jacob, meaning heel clutcher. Maturing into an ambitious young man with his mother's help, he tricked his brother out of Esau's birthright and then temporarily took on Esau's name and characteristics to fool their father into giving him the older son's blessing. And then when he'd gotten what he thought he wanted most, the birthright and the blessing, he had to flee for his life. Later in his life, on his way back to the land of Canaan, after years of working for his uncle Laban and accumulating wives and children and herds and flocks, Jacob encounters his mysterious midnight wrestling partner. And they wrestle all night and in the morning, when the stranger wants to leave, Jacob hangs on, insisting on a blessing from him. He doesn't really get the blessing, but he gets a new name instead. His name had been Jacob, heel clutcher, but from now on, it will be Israel, God clutcher, or one who strives with God. On that very night when Jacob thought he was returning in triumph home to Canaan, bringing with him all the, the family and worldly goods he had worked for years to accumulate, on that very night, Jacob gets his name changed, exposing his, his real identity. He had thought he had arrived, he was ready to go forward in his life in triumph, the big man, and then all night he struggled with that stranger, perhaps an angel. Anyway, someone sent from God. And he emerged in the morning having arrived. But arrived at what? He arrived at the capacity to strive, the ability to struggle. The new blessing he wins from an angelic stranger is the identity of a person who will not let go a struggler, a striver. As the sun rises, Jacob limps away, 
And yet he's exuberant. He has arrived at striving. He has arrived at his identity. And he has a new name to show for it. Simon, Jesus' disciple, as we hear about him in the Gospel of John, arrives in the same place when Jesus renames him Cephas, or Peter, the rock. As we know, and Peter himself no doubt was painfully aware, he was a long way from being the stalwart, dependable rock at this point in his life. So why does Jesus declare this disciple, who is about as solid as quicksand, to be his rock? Because it's a name to strive for, to wrestle with, to become. It's only after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection that Peter begins to really become his new name. And even as he stood firm and preached and suffered and proclaimed and remained a solid foundation for the new young church, he knew he still had a few sandy, soggy corners, some soft spots, flaky bits. But like Jacob, he had arrived at the capacity to strive, to wrestle, to work toward the identity that God had given him. Having our names changed, changing our identity, even just plain change, is difficult. We don't like it whether we're being asked by someone else or even when we ourselves are the ones hoping to make changes in our lives. We have every excuse in the book for, for not changing. There's a, a school system in Pennsylvania and they collected some of the excuses that parents wrote for their elementary school children. Parents hurrying out of the house, parents having trouble spelling, parents perhaps making a bit too quick of a choice of phrases. Please excuse Fred for being absent yesterday. He was sick and I had him shot. Or Mary was sick yesterday. Please execute her. Please excuse Larry for being, it's his father's fault. Please excuse Tim for being absent yesterday. He had diarrhea yesterday and his boots leak. Making changes and not excuses in our lives, living up to our names is hard. Many feel compelled to be richer than, smarter than, better than someone else, or a bunch of someone else's that we feel obliged to measure ourselves against. But God has given us a way out of this by giving us the one name that frees us from all the other title quests. The kingdom of God now has a human name and a human face, that of Jesus Christ. It's through the power of his name that we can be who we are as his disciples. Because of the gift, his gift of himself and the power of God that he brought to us, we can indeed be the children of God. We can be sons and daughters of God, part of God's household. A new name has been added to our identity. Christian. And though like Peter, we're still in the process of living up to this name, we make excuses and we still have some flaky bits, because God gives us this new name in Christ, we have the power to live to be Christians, and to follow him into God's kingdom. An American pastor tells of visiting Seoul, Korea, and going into a tailor shop. And the South Korean tailor was named Smitty Lee. When the pastor asked if Smitty was a Korean name, the tailor told the story of his life being saved during the Korean War by an American soldier named Smitty Ransom. The tailor explained a common custom in Asian culture. He said, he saved my life. I took his name. And that is indeed what we do when we encounter Jesus. He saves our lives, we take his name. 
And we then follow him, fashioning our lives, fashioning our identities with his power into the identity he has given us. Let us pray. Gracious God, you know we prefer to make excuses. Our sandy corners and flaky bits sometimes hide the new identity, the new name you've given us. Help us to welcome the name change. Teach us to live into the new people you have both given us and called us to be. In the name of the one who gives us this new name, Jesus the Christ, amen. I invite you to join me in, the, in our affirmation of faith, which comes from the Confession of Belhar, which was composed in South Africa in 1986. We believe that God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in, in and out through Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker, that the church is witnessed both by world and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. We believe that God's living, given worth and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, and therefore also of reconciliation and hatred, bitterness, and enmity, that God's life, given world, and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world.
Let us pray. Most gracious God, for your choice of one people among the world's peoples, for the revealing of yourself and of your will for human life, we thank you. Through Moses, you gave your people the law. Through your prophets, you charged them so to live by your law that their lives might be a guiding light for all the nations. In your own good time, O oh God, you moved to reveal yourself firsthand in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. We give you thanks for the cherished stories which surround his birth, particularly particularly for the story of that bright and wondrous star that guided Magi from far away to his side. With them, we hail the light of your love for your creation and for us, which shone from that infant and would shine with dazzling radiance from the adult he grew up to be. We thank you for expanding your circle of witnesses to include beyond his people all those who find in him the light of the world, for creating a new people, a worldwide community of his disciples, the church. We pray for the church, for that strange, richly diverse company of women and men who found in your divine son a fresh start for human history and an unquenchable source of light. Help us, O oh God, to let the light of Christ shine from us, that we may be sources of light for others who may stumble about in ignorance or anxiety, self-destruction, hatred, or any other form of darkness. Grant that we may serve as messengers of your grace for those we love and friends whose lives have been darkened by illness, who are at this moment walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray especially for those we name in our hearts. Give them your healing, give them your comfort, Give them hope in you. Gracious God, we pray that you provide us with a star for our own lives so that we are always pointed in your direction, finding the treasure of the Christ child with each step we take. Grant us the wisdom to discern what is right and true. And in all things source of life, may we know that your love is constant as you give us the adventures of the Christian life each day. We pray in the name of the one who brought us your love, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Yeah. 
business free and never be the same. Go out into the world in peace, rejoicing in the promise and the possibility of our new identities, our new name. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.